So, good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, podcast for this week. Um, we were Paul and I were both sort of a little bit moved this morning, actually. I, I don't know if anybody happened to see the podcast that was on, I think, BBC Radio 1 uh, with Jamie and Spencer. In fact, ultimately, they, they brought in Bear Grylls. Um, and I must confess, I, Paul, had no idea, really, because I saw that this morning, that um, Spencer Matthews' his brother had been, at the time, albeit, albeit short-lived, the youngest person ever to summit Mount Everest. And, it, and in fact, sadly... Um, had perished sort of on the way down the mountain, thus effectively handing over that title to, to Bear Grylls. And please don't take that the wrong way. That That's a fact rather than a sort of opinion. Um, and that certainly got got me to thinking, Paul, really, about, you know, what some of the stuff that you and I have done, some of the risks I guess we've taken in some regard. And I know certainly you and I like to talk about some of the circumstances we've put ourselves in regarding you know, how does that transfer to business, how does that transfer to work, et cetera. And I certainly think that, you know, for me, that kind of triggered some of those thought processes this morning. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things that we always say you know, to start us off is I always say that, the, you know, the summit of any mountain is only halfway. And I think that that's something that, you know, people quite often forget. And, and sadly, the facts of Everest are that more people actually perish on the way down and the way up. Um, you know, and I think when we sort of start to work planning and our planning cycles, you know, the summit's only halfway, you've got to get back down again. Um, I think it's probably yeah. probably not a bad place to start. <laughs> No, exactly. I, I was I was amazed when we when we did the Matterhorn, which we, we've spoken about before on this podcast. I was amazed that it took us um, about four hours to get up and five hours to get down. You know, you just think going downhill is easy, but uh, <laughs> it's a lot harder and, uh, and it took us longer. Yeah. And I can I can absolutely understand why people put so much effort into getting to the top and then haven't got the um, perhaps haven't got the energy to to keep that concentration going. Often when you hit your goal. And unfortunately, maybe uh, the goal should be to come down, but maybe the goal is to hit the top. Uh, the risk is sometimes, I suppose, to take your foot off the gas. But my gosh, yeah, I, I was amazed at how hard coming down the mountain was when we did that matter one. I know it doesn't really equate to the Everest. Obviously, you, you've got more experience with that than me, Tim. But uh, yeah, quite quite shocked on that one. Yeah, I, for one, I've always found coming down harder, harder on my knees, my body. And actually, I think what was also actually quite interesting is I think psychologically uh, it's harder, whether that's because there's kind of no longer mission in sight and you've kind of done it or not, you've kind of made the summit or not. And suddenly it's almost as though psychologically you're in sort of no man's land and you're just trying to get through this moment. Um, I think that probably equates to business. I think I talk to a lot of people at the moment that are sort of saying, I'm in a kind of doldrums, I'm in kind of no man's land. It's it's kind of we are locked down but we're not and you know the vaccine's coming but it's not quite here and it's not dissimilar for me to that kind of descent it's just that kind of not quite sure where I'm going or why I've lost that drive and that purpose. Yeah so uh, what are we going to talk about today obviously we we uh, both military guys both spent some time in Afghanistan uh, and then you know coming back to civilian life um, there perhaps isn't that um, that camaraderie and uh, adrenaline rush or challenge that perhaps you quite a lot of us probably you and me probably one of the reasons we joined the military in the first place uh, so um, certainly a couple of years ago we set ourselves that challenge of doing uh, something silly each month to to try and do uh, and Tim you're the uh, you're the expert or the, very much more experienced in mountaineering than me and you've convinced me to uh, to, to get involved and do uh, you know, go and do some reasonable high, reasonably high altitude uh, mountaineering in in Europe in the Alps. Uh, and obviously, the Matterhorn was was pretty awesome. Uh, I was uh, very thankful you dragged me up and uh, and dragged me back down. Um, uh, what do you think? What what what's it like? What are you? How are we? How are you equating the uh, the adventures and the adventurism and the mountaineering with perhaps how life was uh, when we were younger in the military? I think for me, and I think it's the same probably true of business, it's the, it's like the microcosm of pressure, isn't it? You know, kind of, we, we, you and I stand in front of businesses and we, and we talk quite regularly about, you know, what happens when you're under pressure? What happens if you've got to make difficult decisions? Um, what do you do when you want to be the Spartan leader, but perhaps it's not the right thing to at that moment? And I think for me, one of the things I've found is obviously the military taught us to deal with that and gave us a skill set. But certainly the mountaineering thing has enabled us to kind of, A, stay current, I guess, and I think personally, practice practice what we preach a little bit, Paul. I think um, I remember you and I, uh, Gately PLC being one of our sort of um, larger clients. And I remember you and I sending them a video message. We were just running a developing leader program, and we had to turn back on Mont Blanc. If you remember, the weather conditions weren't good, 
And we had to take the the right but the tough decision to say that, OK, we've spent a week in the Alps pushing it, but actually it's not right. And, we, and the right decision is to turn around and go back down again. And, you know, none of us, want, neither of us wanted to do that. Um, but that was the right decision to take. So, and I remember talking to those lawyers later and them saying, well, actually, that, that was pretty cool to kind of listen to you guys tired, exhausted, practicing what you preach. So I think for me, it's a, it's, it's a way of you and I staying current and perhaps proving to some of the delegates that we, you know, still, still sort of practice what we preach. Yeah, it's very easy to be an X this and an X that. Um, but it is, yeah, I think it means that we can still put it in practice, make sure it works. The um, the, the the day, pretty much the day before, I think it was, uh, before we made that call, we were doing some training, weren't we? And I suppose it sort of highlights our uh, how we bounce off each other, how we interact, how we sort of lead almost almost it isn't one of us leading and one of us following it, it swaps and changes um during the day and during the situation um there was that time when when you were following me up to the I think <laughs> I know going. in the evening weren't we coming up to the hut in the evening Possibly and i was be. i was breaking trail um and uh and you very nicely uh came up to me and had a chat with me wasn't it that was quite funny um I don't know if you want to expand on that, Tim. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should probably set. I think we should probably set the scene. It was one of the most bizarre days of my life, actually. Uh, for, for any of you that have been to Chamonix, uh, you'll know that you can get the Agui de Me Midi, rather cable cart, right away up to the top. And you know, there's two weird things. It's either full of proper skiers and mountaineers, or fundamentally Japanese tourists. Uh, so, so I found myself standing in a cable car, uh, dripping in sort of ice axes, crampons. Uh, skis and, and all the gear to go with it, generally feeling a little bit bare grills, as we were talking about bare earlier. <laughs> and yet, stood to my left is a whole load of people in fur coats and fur jackets. And I just remember standing there thinking, you know, one of us has got this well wrong. Um, <laughs> and you come off that cable car at the top, and then you go kind of there's like a gate on the end, and the tourists are all stood taking pictures. And you have that quite cool moment where you go through the gate and out onto that erect, you know, come down that knife edge. And um, we put the skis on and we skied sort of, obviously it's effectively the top of the Valley Blanche, but you ski across. And then we had probably a three, 400 metre climb back up through probably some pretty deep snow. And um, I was quite tired actually. I think we'd, we'd been in the Alps a couple of days by then and you were feeling pretty strong. So Paul took the lead. And for anyone who's ever done this before, breaking trail is spectacularly hard work. So in other words, being the person at the front, pushing the snow out of the way. And it's not unlike in business when you're the person with the new idea who's trying to invoke change, you're the person pushing that thing forward. And it's very much like that. So Paul's kind of driving the snow out of the way and I'm just in his tracks behind him really. So I guess the cyclists can probably equate to this. You know, you're probably pushing out 30% less energy or whatever behind him. And I could see Paul battling on but refusing to quit. And I just thought it's really, really interesting because Paul's absolutely capable physically, you know, arguably stronger than I am in the hills and, and yet, actually, I could see that it, the right thing to do is take over a bit. But I remember thinking to myself, he's tired. We're at nearly 4,000 metres of altitude. If I just suggest that Paulie gets out of the way, he's going to take that as me thinking he's not up to it, not strong enough, not good enough. And there'll be a row and it'll get like messy and it'll be no good. And if you just remember, I remember sitting there thinking, how do I tell Paul I'm keen to do my stint on the front to give him a breather because he's done an amazing job this far, rather than making it sound as though, you know, actually get out of the way, big lads. We want to get there tonight. Um, I don't know. I guess we didn't punch each other. He didn't punch me, so he must have done something wrong. It's amazing, isn't it? And I suppose we, we teach a lot of this. It's 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 changing your style or, or changing how you say it, not changing what you say, but changing how you say it, depending on the situation, depending on the on the people. And you're right, if you come up and gone, Paul, oh, you're looking knackered, get out of the way, I'll take over. I'd have bitten. I'd have been like, ooh, ouch, you know, not happy with that. I, I'm strong enough. I can keep going. We'd have had an argument. But the way you just said, oh, I think it's my turn now you know uh, I, I think we're halfway I'll do my half it was like oh brilliant and I suppose we can all learn from that there are loads of situations where you can say that you can say what you want to say and if you say it one way the whole team gets angry and hates you and if you say it the other way everyone's like oh yeah well done thanks very much for that um so yeah it's, it's I suppose it's that chameleon leadership or that chameleon you know being a bit lighter foot changing how you're going to come across depending on it um I think a lot of a lot of new leaders have have the same thing. You know, I was um, perhaps le uh, less experienced than you in terms of mountaineering, and I knew that. But I was out front, and I was like, "I'm going to I'm going to prove myself here. I'm I'm strong. I'm going to keep going." And uh, you know, thinking back in in retrospect, 
when you get promoted, when you become a leader, when you're in charge of a team, you can sometimes feel that, can't you? You're like, oh, I've got to be out front. I've got to be the one doing more work than everyone else. I've got to be proving that I should have been promoted. I've got to prove to everyone that by doing more work and doing their job better and harder. Uh, and all that was doing was trashing me. I was getting more and more tired. We were going slower and slower. Um, and really, the best thing to do was to delegate to someone else to take over. And my God, it's easier <laughs> when, when you're in when you're in someone else's track. Yeah, you were stuck between me and beer and cosmic sweat as well, which is, which is yeah. never a good place to be standing. <laughs> Uh, was that when we met the Russians or was that another day? That was when we ended up drinking at 4,000 metres with two former Spetsnaz ice climbers, which which is a story for another day. And, and you know, for those of you that are listening, it ended exactly the way that you think it was going to end fundamentally. Yeah, um, and it's exactly. probably still highly classified. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, actually, Paul, you make another point there, which I think is quite interesting, which is, you know, newly promoted, isn't it? And I, and I think, for me, when we start to talk about adventure stuff over the military but there's a common chat that you know sandhurst the army make uh, good leaders and yes of course good leaders come out of the army but actually you know leading somebody when you're an officer you've been to sandhurst the troops haven't by definition they have to call you sir and fundamentally do what they're told um is, is an easier in my view situation than when you're trying to lead peers and i think one of the things that we see quite a lot are people promoted from within the team um, I know that's what you're pretty passionate about, isn't it? Yeah, it happens a lot. I mean, it very rarely happens in the military. They, and because of what we're going to talk about, the, the issues and the problems and the and the clashes that happen. Uh, but in business, it happens quite a lot. You're doing a brilliant job in the team. Someone identifies you, the business, the company identifies you as a as a future star and they promote you. And now all of a sudden, you know, fun Paul, who used to go down the pub and have a laugh and joke around, uh, is now in charge. Were you or ever fun, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, you know, all of a sudden, fun Paul is now not so fun Paul. Fun Paul is boss Paul. Uh, is that the Paul that bought that loud blue suit? <laughs> yeah, that was a lovely suit. I like that. <laughs> but but that then causes all the problems because there's the, you have mentally got to switch that gear and also the team have got to be uh mature enough to understand that you've changed position now you are you're not the same person that you were uh, and that can that can cause a lot of problems we um we've got a phrase haven't we tim you know whinge up not not down and <laughs> big problem the big problem with with uh, when you're promoted, when you used to be in the team, is that in the past, you used to go to the coffee room, you used to go to the pub, and you used to sit there and you gossip and whinge and, and go, oh, you know, head office don't understand, and and uh, Dave from accounts, he's an idiot, and I don't like this person. And, you know, you, you let off steam in, in, a, in the normal way, and, you know, you have a good whinge about it. If you're now, if there's now a mismatch, if you're no, if, if you're the boss, you can no longer come in there and start whinging to your what used to be your team, it used to be your um, uh, people that you used to work with, who are now your subordinates. You can't do that anymore. So you always whinge up, never whinge down. I'm laughing uh, because I can remember a day on the side of a hill on a very hot day on a military exercise. Oh, remember? Yeah. So we, uh, Paul and I, were both troop were both troop commanders at the time and we were leading, uh, I think it was like uh, long range reconnaissance stuff, was it? Long range reconnaissance yeah. patrols and stuff. We were, for a few, we were out for a while, yeah. So I think we've, we, you know, to put it in context, we haven't slept very much for probably, I don't know, a week, uh, 10 days or something on those lines and we've walked a really long way carrying big rucksacks and all of the kind of usual stuff and the, and the exercise was coming into a bit of a culmination and, and Paul had his team and I had my team and uh, whilst we've been largely operating separately most of the time, we came together for this particular particular evolution of the exercise. And in, in fact, I think we were trying to escape and evade Paul, weren't we? I think we were moving around RVs or something yeah. along those lines. Anyway, anyway, and I remember coming in to him, Paul, thinking, oh, it's brilliant, there's Paul, great. You know, perhaps have a chance to, you know, grab a coffee together or something uh, whilst, the, whilst the boys were sorting themselves out and stuff. I remember Paul he goes, Tim, uh, Tim, uh, I need to, I need to talk to you about, uh, you know, the the thing, uh, the, you know, the, thing, <laughs> the, the mission, the map, the, uh, and I'm like, Paul, I'm, what are you talking about? You know, this definitely wasn't fun, Paul. Uh, and I was like, I don't, I don't understand. I can't. What is he talking about? Um, Paul's like, you know, come on, you need to like, over, over, let's go over here. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Like, let's sort the kids out. And Paul's like, no, you come over here. I was like, right, okay, fine, yeah, sure. So I go behind this tree, 
that, don't read too much into that. I mean, he's a good looking boy, but he's not that good looking. And Paul just looked at me and he just let rip. And he was like, this exercise, these people, I'm trying really hard not to swear now. He's like, this is outrageous. That is outrageous. This is no good. That's no good. And as for this bloke, can I just shoot him myself and save the enemy a job? Like what, literally what is going on? And Paul just went berserk for about 40 <laughs> seconds. I sort of stood there and went, all right, mate. Yeah, yeah, perfect. To to like, totally agree. He, and he kind of hugged me and he went, thanks very much, and went back to being, you know, the sharp military officer that he is. <laughs> what, was, what was going on, Paul? I, I, I do remember that, actually, yeah. Well, there was a load of things. I was tired, grumpy, you know, not eating yeah. that much, et cetera, lots of pressure. And, and you know, that was, that was what the military was doing. It was, a, it was, a, it was an exercise. Um, but I... I couldn't, I had to put the face on. I couldn't go to the guys, this is rubbish, it's awful, I hate this, blah, 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 because that would have pulled them down, dropped their morale, they would perhaps have lost respect for me, uh, you know, oh, well, maybe maybe Paul has no idea what's going on, you know, uh, maybe I didn't, but I was trying I'm to pretend sure that I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to come across... If you were like, asking me advice, you definitely did not know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> but but because because I was the boss, and at that point in my team, I was the highest ranking person there. I couldn't whinge and grump and unload. So and it was only when we just happened to bump into you, and it was like, right, let's go and have a good whinge, let it all out. It's good to have a whinge. That's why we all do it. But you just can't do it to the to people who work for you anymore. Um, you've got to whinge at your level or or whinge to your boss. Uh, and that's uh, otherwise you just you just drag everyone's morale down and you make everyone lose confidence in the plan. Um, and, you know, Tim, you've said it before, you know, a, a bad plan executed well is much better than a great plan executed poorly. You know, if you've just got to get everyone to put their put their shoulders to it and drive. And even if it's not a great idea, if everyone really tries hard, you've got a good chance of, uh, of getting it uh, getting it done. I mean, my absolute worst annoyance is when someone walks into the room. Uh, to give a briefing, to tell people what's going on, to tell the team what's now changed, and they start off with an apology. And it's just, yeah. it just ruins whatever you say next, you've just destroyed. If you walk in and go, team, I'm really sorry, I don't want to say this, but head office are telling me to do it. There's no overtime next week, or we need you all to work two hours later this evening. I'm really sorry, it's not me, it's, it's, it's my boss absolute garbage you've just ruined everyone's uh you've brought everyone's morale down uh you've probably lost a lot of respect for yourself and you've uh you, you've made the team no longer respect you or the chain of command or your boss or their boss and so walking in and, and starting with an apology is just the worst thing in the world i um, think the irony is there i think the irony there paul sorry i agree with you but i think the irony yeah. is people think they're building rapport don't they i think that's the thing people think oh i'm equating with a team i'm building bonds with my team and that, you know, actually, if we go back to some of the high pressure situations you and I have found ourselves in, actually, what you've got to do is provide reassurance and direction. You don't need to be a Spartan, but provide reassurance and direction. And in fact, as you say, like, oh, well, I'm sorry. And I always laugh with presenters, don't we? When we train quite a lot of presenters, and it's, you know, don't apologize for a slide you've just shown a 500 strong audience. Don't show it. Um, and and it's, a, it's a similar thing, isn't it? It's that kind of. Uh, they think you build a rapport with a team, but actually what you do is driving a wedge between the two. And yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, you've, you've just ruined any confidence that the team has that you've got an idea, you've got a plan, you've got the solution that that the rest of the uh, the head office or whatever has got a plan. You've just ruined it all by walking in there and, and whinging. Uh, unfortunately, you've got to do that whinging beforehand. And if you really disagree with the idea, the change, the plan, whatever it is, go to your boss, say, look, this is a, this is a rubbish idea. I don't like it. It's not going to work. Do all that beforehand. Eventually, you've got two choices. You either accept that your boss is telling you to go and do it, or you or you resign. I suppose you say, "Well, I, I'm not doing it. I can't. I, I don't. I don't believe in it that strongly, and I can't possibly stand up and and go and say that." But if uh, at the end of the day, the boss may well know more. Will hopefully uh, have a better understanding. You, if you're going to stay in the company, uh, have to put your face on, walk in there, and go. Right. Guess what? We've got a great plan. Let's do this uh, and come across like that. Any issues you've got, you've got to sort them out beforehand with, with your boss and uh, your boss's boss. Well, I think it ties quite well to what we're saying about being part of the solution. You know, again, harking back to the climbing stuff, it's very much about problem solving all the time. And perhaps that's something that's just occurred to me is, OK, we need to get from here to there. That's not an option. You know, when you and I came out of that hut at dawn the following morning and we had to get down Valley Blanche from top to bottom, we had to get to the bottom. There's no other way down. So actually, it's a question of, 
being part of the solution, working the problem, finding out what we can do, isn't it? And I think with the whinging thing, it's a little bit the same. It's like, okay, fine. You might not like what you've got to do, but there's probably a reason for it. Understand the outcome, understand the in order to, if you like, as we always say, and then actually be part of the solution. And if if you don't like the solution you, you've been given, don't point out where it's wrong. Fi- find a better one. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of negativity we're seeing on the news at the moment. And in fact, if we could just be a bit more, okay, let's focus on finding the answers and, and moving towards the solution rather than highlighting all of the problems. I don't know, maybe we start to make a bit of a difference. Yeah. Uh, guys, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we'll see you all uh, again next week. Thanks very much, Paul. Yeah.